Wow. I'm feeling hyped. All right. Well, uh, thank you, everybody. I'm Alexis Ohanian. Very grateful to be hosting uh, for the next 45 minutes um, against some pretty real competition uh, going on in Washington, D.C., uh, but we're bringing it. We've got uh, some really talented folks to talk through uh, a, a lot of very, very important issues about addressing online hate uh, and then what really the tech sector can do to better better fight it, better address it. Um, first and foremost, very grateful to be here. Um, Derek, president and CEO of the NAACP, a longtime civil rights activist. Um, Elishka, uh, who is Access Now's Europe policy analyst. Um, she's been working on her doctoral dissertation focused on freedom of expression on the internet, as well as online content regulation, uh, issues that we know are going to be coming up quite a bit in the, in the years to come. Uh, and finally, John, uh, the founder and CEO of Centropy, uh, artificial intelligence company using uh, machine learning to fight and combat hate and harassment online. Um, and shout out, thank you to RightsCon uh, for running this uh, so consistently, giving a platform um, for these kinds of important conversations, these important issues that frankly don't get enough attention normally. So, so thank you for that. Um, again, like I said, we're here to talk about uh, some very important issues. We only have 40 minutes to get into it, so I'd like to just dive right in. Um, Derek, you know, right off the bat, um, as president and CEO of the NAACP, um, can you talk a little bit specifically about the important work the organization does, and then also how that's evolved, especially in the last few years, um, to address issues not just offline, uh, but also online? So thank you, Alexis, and I'm glad to join this panel. Uh, NAACP, the nation's oldest civil rights organization, established in 1909, 111 years old, uh, we were established to uh, fight to improve the quality of life for African Americans and other disenfranchised communities in the United States, but also to fight against discrimination. And over time, as we uh, would carry on our different policy fights as an advocacy organization advocating for public policy and, and private corporate behavior consistent with uh, treating people with dignity, uh, we recognize that uh, the fight must go online. Uh, if you look at the 2016 election cycle, you look at the rise of racial hate groups and white supremacist groups that have now used social media platforms as their meeting and, and recruitment hub. In NAACP, we've had to evolve uh, to begin to monitor and take on fights in that space as well. In 2016, platforms were used to uh, uh, seek to manipulate the outcome of our elections. Uh, it was used by both foreign and domestic entities that uh, sought to undermine democracy using race as one of the weapons. Uh, but also, uh, if you look at some of the platforms, white supremacist groups and racial hate groups uh, use platforms to recruit and propagate uh, uh, information that's not true and also misinform as it relates to elections, as it relates to COVID and so many other things. So as an organization, we've had to evolve to begin to address those issues as well. Well, uh, you know, it goes without saying that this work is vital, um, especially at a time when, like you pointed out, there is there has historically always been ways to use uh, media, whether it was the internet or anything before it, to spread propaganda, uh, to stoke the, the 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 sort of fires of hate, and, and that that is something that has sadly uh, been with us for for quite some time. The technology to be able to connect these sorts of like minded people, though, uh, is is pretty new, and and so where traditionally people would only really be able to organize offline and come together, you know, after hours in in basements or beer halls or wherever, um, the internet has now created an environment where they can actually not just be misinformed, but also find find a sense of community, find a sense of connection, find a sense of belonging at scale. And, you know, the vast majority of the time, this is innocuous um, and it's harmless and it's about Pokemon and that's great. Uh, but when it isn't, there is a really important responsibility there uh, for, for understanding the repercussions of that uh, because it does go even a step further beyond just mis misinformation when you're actually creating community around this and you're really normalizing this kind of, of hateful behavior. Um, you know, uh, John, your, your previous company sold to Apple. 
Um, you, you definitely have assembled a team of experts on uh, the, the artificial intelligence side of, of the technology world. Um, you know, I think a lot of people don't fully understand uh, really the, the prevalence and the scale of online hate. Um, could you start to maybe put some numbers on it or put some more uh, kind of data behind just what the average Internet user uh, it, it could be facing? Yeah, of course. And and thanks, Alexis, and thanks to RightsCon for having me. Um, the scale of this problem has grown exponentially over the last 30 years. As you think about the formation of the Internet, as you think about the formation of social media companies, today in the United States, a third of adults and 60% of teens have suffered severe online harassment. Now, the scary part of this stat for me is that this these online experiences have very real offline effects. I talk a lot about this idea of, you know, our our impact from URL to IRL, right? And we see this constantly. We're, we've seen this during COVID. We've seen this um, during the protests around George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, amongst others. Um, and, you know, we see this on a, on a day on day basis where this harassment is normalized, frankly. Um, if you're a woman and you're harassed online, there's a greater than 50% chance that you're gonna experience stress, anxiety, or panic attacks. If you're a teen, your risk of suicidal ideation goes up by about 200% and suicidal attempts go up by 100%. And so I, you know, I'm a father of two boys and this last stat is particularly terrifying for me. But the thing that I'm really focused on and what my company is focused on is how do we remove the normalization of this behavior, as you pointed out, right? Where people get into these rabbit holes. One to 3% of content on platforms, um, in our experience, is a direct violation of some content policy, right? And so this is the level of toxicity that we see in these online communities. And we've seen quite a bit more depending on the community that we've studied or engaged with at this point. And so this is not a problem that is small in nature. One to three percent might sound small. So let me put it in context really quickly. So if you're a platform like Reddit, you're seeing about 350,000 posts an hour. If you're a dating site like Bumble, you're about double that. And a company like Discord, which is more of a real time chat application, sees about 20 million messages per hour. Now think about one percent of that content and the scale of that when it comes to actually having to moderate and handle this content and think about the implications of the content. It is a massive problem. And it's it's not just a problem for the platforms, it's a problem for society at this point. You know, I think when we talk about the societal implications, um, Alishka, you've got quite, quite a bit of depth and background here, especially from a European perspective. Um, helping to guide policy around everything from combating uh, terrorism and recruiting um, to, to really understanding the, the sort of the balance that, that we in, in, in so many uh, sort of Western societies have between freedom of expression and wanting to combat hate. Um, and, and can you talk about those competing priorities and how, that they, how they are balanced? Um, so I will start answering your question with maybe specifying a little bit why actually it is so difficult and often challenging to combat online hate speech specifically, which is quite a particular type yes. of user-generated content. Um, is it okay? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, perfect. Uh, so first of all, uh, hate speech in general, of course, is not a new phenomenon. And at the international level, meaning if we, if we look at this from the perspective of international human rights law, there is no universally accepted definition of what actually amounts to hate speech. And the same translates then into the online context. Hate speech is deeply context dependent. That means something that will be considered as hateful content in one country doesn't have to be a hateful content, content somewhere else in different parts of the world it directly linked to the socio-political and historical background of the country. And precisely due to its vagueness and contextual dependency, it can actually, the restrictions on hate speech can take two directions if we consider the most extreme responses. 
One might be a uh, way to restrictive measures adopted by government or sometimes even by platforms, but that are not in line with international human rights standards. And let me just remind you that according to international human rights law, the restrictions of freedom of expression on freedom of expression have to meet principles of something we call legality, proportionality, and necessity. Um, and this applies online as much as it applies offline. And precisely due to this contextual dependency, Another difficulty arises with the use of automation to combat uh, such a type of content. And the similar contextual dependency also applies to, for instance, online terrorist content that you mentioned, because there is also no universal definition of what truly amounts to terrorism. And the vague terminology that often finds its way to national legislation then can be abused by the state actors and other actors that don't have human rights of online users as the main priority. Um, so when it comes to automation and depiction of online hate speech, it's totally understandable that platforms have to rely on automated tools and content recognition technologies in order to cope with the huge amount of user generated content that is being shared on those platforms on a daily basis. Uh, however, we also see a uh, lot of difficulties in the use of these automated measures, specifically due to the contextual dependency, which often results then to these automated tools generating false negatives or false positives, which is a very machine learning uh, language now, meaning uh, they misidentify the content, thinking that this might be actually the case of online hate speech, while this can easily be a journalistic content or a piece of article published by researchers that actually contains certain terminology that the automation tool depict and thinks that this is undesirable content that should be restricted on the platform. Um, so to strike the balance is very difficult. And the final point I would like to make is that unless we will be relying on solutions that actually mainly focus on deletion, removal and blocking of such content, uh, that will never translate into any sustainable approach to online hate speech, which is truly uh, a big issue. And it can be potentially harmful because that harm in online hate speech is of collective nature. So it can actually incite discrimination against vulnerable and underrepresented groups in the society. But we should rather also focus on the, the way how the content is being distributed on these platforms, how often hateful content is actually being amplified by, by the platforms, and look for the solutions that are very much uh, concentrating on the issue of transparency and in order to really understand what happens on platforms, what kind of content is being shared, and what are, what are those content moderation practices that platforms deploy. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think ultimately the more sunlight uh, that we can provide in these situations, uh, the better. Um, you know, there's been uh, a lot of talk lately. I don't know if maybe Zuck is, is uh, addressing this literally right now. Um, about uh, the NAACP's campaign, hashtag Stop Hate for Profit. Um, Derek, can you talk a little bit about what it is? I mean, I, I suspect most of the folks listening to this have, have seen it in the headlines in the last month or two, but what you and your partners are hoping to accomplish with this. But thank you. So our goal is to keep people safe and protect our democracy, uh, very simply. Uh, you know, many people may have heard of the group that was meeting on the Facebook platform called Boogaloo. <coughs> and as a result of that, that group was also uh, buying ads, recruiting members, uh, and the outcome was uh, carrying out an effort to kill a federal officer. Uh, where a foreign nation was trying to influence and in many ways did influence the outcome of our election. Our, our job uh, is to stop that type of spread of hate, stop the, the undermining of our democracy, and, and talk about the limitations of freedom of expression and freedom of speech. You know, uh, as a law student in constitutional law class in the United States, uh, one of the things we learn quickly around freedom of speech is that there are limitations. Uh, you cannot scream fire in a theater because the very act of doing so could cause harm, especially if there's no fire. And so there are limitations. And we're saying on social media platforms, 
there have to be guardrails in place so you're not creating a platform for others to cause harm against the general society, particularly carrying out of violent attacks. Uh, that should not be the case. It, can, it is not the case in, 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 on media platforms, and it should not be the case on social media platforms. Yeah, and this is something I, I really have evolved. Um, I really have evolved my thinking around this over the last, geez, 15 years. Um, and especially in the last, I'd say, five, it's really become clear the kind of role that is played here. And, and I think it's the, the, the heartening thing is, you know, every now and then a new platform full of hate gets created. There was vote um, or, or, or platforms that are built around this idea of like ultimate free speech, right? Gab, um, the free market basically builds alternatives and time and time again, they fail through some combination of just limited people who actually want that to, I don't even know what, but, but the, I, I think for a long time, what we would hear from platforms is that there was this imperative. There was a very large population of users that really only use the site for those reasons. Even if they didn't consume the content principally, they felt it was important, but what's become overwhelmingly clear now, 15 years in the social media experiment is that, creating those boundaries is actually better for retention creating those boundaries is actually better for business like this is actually what users are asking for in some cases you know blacking out the site in protest to try to get it uh, and so when there's so much bottom up demand i think it does help shift the conversation i'm intrigued i mean i know this was just a first step of many I i'd like to know where is it headed um, cause I have a feeling the stop pay for profit campaign doesn't just, doesn't just end here. Um, because this is, this is important work. It is absolutely important work. Uh, we, uh, early on in ACP, we had a log off Facebook campaign, uh, ineffective mm -hmm. because it's such a behemoth of a company. Uh, and there are so many people around the globe who use it. Uh, uh, we, partner with Color of Change, Anti-Defamation League, mm -hmm. uh, the Free Press, and many other groups to launch a new campaign to add to ask ad buyers to suspend ad purchases during the uh, month of July. And it was uh, overwhelming success. But Facebook is such a large company. There, there are no guardrails of protection for people. 60% uh, of all the stock is owned by one individual. Uh, there is no true mm -hmm. market force to force them to do what's right. There is no uh, regulatory body in the United States or globally to force them to do what's right or just keep people safe and protect uh, systems of government. Uh, we gotta continue to put on the pressure. Uh, otherwise, we, will, we are looking at a sovereign nation within a sovereign nation uh, without mm -hmm. any rules. And anytime we have this level of unchecked power, people are harmed over time and it's incumbent upon the NAACP and all of our partners and just the general public to make sure the necessary guardrails in place so we could protect people and, and maintain levels of, of order. Mm. Well, I, I think this is, I think very much at the heart of a lot of what we're seeing in DC and we'll, I'll, I'll circle back on that because um, we're seeing this really, I mean, it is in, in many ways, a sort of nation within a nation that has a, a tremendous impact on, on this nation, the United States. Um, one that is right now getting uh, pretty poor grades on how we've handled COVID-19. I think there's lots of reasons why that's been the case. Um, Alishka, can you talk a little bit about the impact of hate speech during COVID-19? Um, and, and we you know just anecdotally i've definitely seen the uptick of of slurs and hate especially directed towards asian americans um online um we're even seeing it in, in various offline and even political scenarios um you know how how does this relate to to the discrimination issues we talked about um and and when these legitimate restrictions of hate speech are really needed Thank you. Um, so I think that COVID-19 global health crisis uh, really brought into a 
daylight all uh, issues surrounding the content governance and regulation of speech on the internet. One of the reasons for that was that, of course, due to the safety measures that the platforms had to adopt uh, in order to guarantee the safety of their content moderators, uh, they had to heavily rely on automation during, during this time. Uh, which meant also that we could experience those mistakes that I mentioned during my first intervention that the automated tools are essentially prone to um, more frequently happening. Um, what was also a good effort from the side of platforms in that regard was that at least some of them tried to include more information into their transparency reports about how the content was restricted during this global health crisis, what was actually directly re restricted through automation, um, and also the number of appeals that they received from online users. Uh, but back to your question and maybe connecting it to the topic of online hate speech, uh, I very much like the statement how uh, I think one of the American media has actually put it that one of the biggest trolls during the COVID-19 uh, health crisis were politicians themselves, especially when they actually were linking the spread of COVID-19 virus to concrete ethnicity or certain groups within the society that were somehow, uh, in general opinion, more affiliate, affiliated with this virus, which, of course, uh, deepened the social stigma, racial stereotypes. And um, if it comes from an important public figure, the damage is even more far reaching. So we directly challenge this um, balance in protecting the freedom of expression and especially political speech versus what kind of impact such a insensitive and often hateful expression coming from a famous political figure can have uh, for that underrepresented group within the society. But again, having said that and coming from the European background where uh, our approach to protection of freedom of expression is that it's, it is not an absolute right, uh, these restrictions can be applied, but they have to meet criteria as stipulated in the law. Um, I, I think that uh, it's, it's important, of course, to protect these groups from these sort of expressions. But at the same time, and I will repeat that argument again, and I think it became even more visible with COVID-19, we need to first understand what's truly happening on those platforms and what kind of restrictions or what kind of policies will truly provide for those solutions and a long-term protection. Um, and I think that the case of automation is definitely a big one here. Um, especially due to those issues that I already mentioned. So understanding why platforms have to rely on content recognition technologies, but at the same time, it's important in order to preserve freedom of expression standards online to acknowledge their short shortcomings and look for the uh, potential solutions. How I'm just curious, how often in your research and, and conversations with these folks and the sort of thought leaders around it, does the argument come back to this freedom of expression argument. I, and I ask this only because these are private companies, right? That can do literally, they, they, they don't need to uphold any standards like a government would. And, and I think you do make a compelling case, uh, Derek, that Facebook is, is in many ways its own sort of, you know, state entity, but, but setting that aside, um, for every other platform, right? They're private businesses. They can have full discretion about where they want to curb expression. If they want to, eliminate letting people use the letter E, like they can do that. And that's fine. And that's within the American constitution. I assume it is uh, fine across all the countries uh, there in the EU. Um, but, but where do you think it is rooted? The, 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 the tying to these ideals, is it purely principle? Is it, is it, is there a business case that, that I'm missing? Oh, Alishka or, 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 or Derek. I don't know about business case. <laughs> you know, the reason why many nations have been able to grow their economies over time is by by putting in place the type of I keep using the word guardrails to protect in individuals, and in the tech space, the guardrails also allow for the tech community to continue to grow. But if you remove or dissolve uh, the, the, those protections, uh, we're only uh, walking down a path of self-destruction. And we should do all we can to continue to grow a tech business community 
uh, make sure it's accountable to the very consumers and people that it's appealing to, and in doing so, uh, operate as a good corporate citizen along with the rest of society. There is a social contract that corporations should also be a part of, and, and that social contract is what has allowed us to exist as a nation uh, and for as long as we've uh, been able to exist. Well, I, I think these these are the conversations that are surfacing up now that are so important. Melishka, did you want to jump in? I know it's kind of awkward through Zoom. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm yeah, sorry for jumping like in. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> Uh, I just would like to add to that, that I would maybe uh, challenge a little bit a statement that these companies don't really have to abide uh, human rights law, human rights standards in any way. It is very much true that the primary duty bearers of human rights obligations, whether these are positive or negative obligations, those are states. But at the same time, international human rights framework recognizes the responsibilities that these companies have uh, for protection of human rights of online users. One of the reasons for mm. that is that uh, we need to bear in mind that this is just not a standard private actor doing a private business for profit. These are major uh, dominant platforms that in some countries, Facebook is the only form of internet people know. Mm. Uh, so their impact over public discourse and over users' human rights is enormous. Uh, that's why we often refer to them as gatekeepers of fundamental rights or gatekeepers of information society. Um, and since they hold this level of dominance, they also, and based on United Nations guiding principles uh, on business and human rights, they hold responsibilities that they have that they should be following and fulfilling and mm. uh, you know protect, respect, and remedy. Uh, those are like those three main principles that the company should implement in their policies as well. Uh, so yes, they might not be those primary duty bearers, but they are still in a way bound by human rights principles. I mean, this, this definitely levels up your point, definitely levels up this conversation because we're talking now about a threshold of responsibility that I think is much greater than any of us in our dorm rooms were thinking about in the the early aughts, in the mid aughts. I mean, the um, thinking about because these are often American based companies that have very global implications with the content they create. Not to mention, you know, the hateful content here in the United States, but but even globally, the implications. Um, you know, a when it was. You know, when it was uh, uh, German radio or newspapers stoking National Socialism in the 30s, you know, you knew the source of it was contained to a country with, you know, implications that that radically changed the world. Um, but these platforms have the capability to not be limited by typical geography. Uh, the content is far more engaging. Sorry, newspaper and radio fans. Uh, the content is designed like a good slot machine to be far more engaging and far more compelling. And frankly, it's not even just the 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 sources of the of the misinformation. It's also the it's the it's the beer halls in Munich. It's the organizing places that these platforms are now also responsible for, where, you know, Hans doesn't need to it's not Hans, you know, going off on a Tuesday night for a, a meeting every week. Um, you know, he doesn't need to just go down the street to the beer hall. Like it's in the beer hall is on his phone uh, and he can jump into the beer hall anytime he wants when he's on a break at work, when he's just, you know, stuck in traffic, although he shouldn't be, um, he shouldn't be on there period. But the, there are much bigger implications when we think about the power of the technology and then the borderlessness of it. And, and I can't help but wonder in an increasingly balkanized world as we're getting more isolationist, uh, you're seeing so many countries now looking so much more inward Then what is what becomes the role of an international body to say like, hey, hold on, like there's there people need to be held to account. Um, I mean, this is gosh, we only have 14 minutes left. Um, I'm, I, I want to shift gears slightly to ask uh, John, what inspired you to start Centropy and and how can the tech industry do more to combat online hate? Because I do believe at the end of the day, as an industry, we all are, are aligned in an end goal, but we just seem to disagree about how to get there and how fast maybe we should move. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alexis. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, I really wanted to start Centropy because every week I was watching the impact of online interactions and systems we're having in the physical world, right? Whether that was bullying, mass shootings, systemic abuse of minorities, our online interactions were creating this lasting implication in real life. And so I got together with um, some former colleagues who are machine learning experts, because fundamentally this, this problem, at least to me at the platform level, boils down to two big buckets. Bucket number one is, can you detect the problem? Bucket number two is, once you detect it, are you willing to do something about it? Which is why I love what Derek um, and all of the people involved in Stop, Hate for Profit are doing, because they're, they're effectively attacking the company's bottom line and trying to force change through you know, them looking at uh, their revenue, quite literally. And so I'm really focused on the problem of detection. And can you detect this, this type of hate, harassment, and abuse that's happening on these platforms so that it doesn't become normalized and you can de-amplify it? I think Olishka made a great point about context. Context is critically important. And I'll give you an example and tie it back to COVID. So in April, my team and I did a study on new language that was emerging, anti-Asian racist language that was emerging as a result of coronavirus. <clears throat> and in that study, we identified over 100 new phrases or terms that were being used to express anti-Asian sentiment. Now, why is this problematic? Well, it's problematic for a couple reasons. Number one is you have media organizations, key political figures touting this new terminology publicly, which helps to normalize it. Number two is language is shifting at such a rapid pace online that you need very advanced systems, in particular machine learning based systems, um, to keep up with that language. And so context is important, the context of where content emerges, um, where it's being posted, as well as who's saying it matters a lot. But fundamentally, this is a question as a starting point, can you just detect the linguistic evolution? Um, I love data, so I'll give you a, a great stat. Urban Dictionary, which is known for housing quite a bit of content that is um, more on the rogue side of the spectrum, gets about a thousand new entries a week. And so when you think about how language is, is morphing and this COVID example, there's, there's some examples around after Ahmaud Aubrey was, was killed, the term jogger popping up as a replacement for the N-word. I mean, this is the type of language that's emerging. And so I wanted to bring the best people and the best technologies to bear to start on detection. Now I'm counting on other people like Alishka and Derek, and frankly, you Alexis, to keep pushing on the policy front so that we can get the companies, once they have the right detection capabilities, to actually take a real stand against this. The last thing I'll, I'll comment on is you asked about the business case. And so I think there's a very clear advertising business case, but the video game industry has done quite a bit of study on the impact of abuse on users. And so a harassed user is 30% more likely to become abusive themselves. So there's this viral toxic loop that you see. 30% of harassed users are churning off of platforms. I mean, I've talked to platforms who have lost 10% of their user base in a single month because of harassment. And this is usually a rating type behavior where an organized group it could be Boogaloo, um, it could be you know the extreme right, it could be the extreme left, um, come into their site and are just harassing people and silencing people. And I think people have lost track of you know, the, um, the, the responsibility to free speech on these platforms in focusing so much on the individual's right to free speech. The, the real challenge though, Alexis, is 55 to 75%, depending on the platform of harassment goes totally unreported. And so look, this requires robust technology to create proactive detection mechanisms. And that's what we're building at Centropy. Yeah, and I just can't even, hearing about the jogger example, both gives you an idea of how how adaptive these hateful communities are and then also how futile it would be to try to i mean you can't there, there's no keyword list large enough that would be able to catch that um and having humans alone solving that problem 
uh, would, would always be playing whack-a-mole and catch up. Um, would, you know, uh, Zuck is obviously busy, can't join us right now. Um, but, uh, you know, he's testifying right now, I think before the House Judiciary Antitrust Subcommittee. Uh, Derek, you know, Zuck's going to get some tough questions about advertising, I'm sure. Um, but if you had a chance to ask him a question today, uh, what, what would it be? When are you going to do something? Uh, I've had a couple of meetings with him, uh, with Shell Sandberg and their team. It's always a wonderful conversation, but we need to see outcomes. How are you going to protect people? How are you going to protect our democracy? Don't tell us about something you did after the fact. Let's do things proactively and set an example. You are, you are the leading platform in so many areas. Lead to make sure people are safe and our democracy is protected. Hmm. That, that is a great verb to lead because I think that is, that's been at the root of at least a lot of my frustrations and I think a lot of people in this industry's frustrations on, on the tech side because we talk about, we take pride in leading through so many things, right? Technology, innovation, uh, paid family leave policy. Like I, I could read the laundry list of things that tech celebrates their leadership around, but somehow, some way, all of that leadership turns into some combination of like cowardice and apathy when it comes to trying to tackle this really important issue. And I would, I would, I would just underscore that. I would love to see more leadership from platforms so that it stops looking like what it has been, which is do the minimum viable effort until it becomes such a big problem, either for press or for business, that you then have to adapt. And, and we wouldn't be satisfied if that's how we shipped product. We wouldn't be satisfied if that's how we did 99% of the other things that we take pride in leading on as an industry. This, this should be no exception. Um, and I don't think it's easy, but I mean, that's what, that's what we signed up for. That's what, we're, that's, that's what we celebrate in this industry is doing the hard stuff. And, um, and so as we look to the future for all of you, uh, what kind of changes would you like to see implemented uh, to better protect users uh, on these community-based platforms? And I don't know, uh, Alishka, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, so I mentioned during my first intervention that um, I, I see and many civil societies in this space see as the core issue, the way how the, uh, the business models of these companies truly. So whether this is targeted advertisement, political advertisement, or open recruitment that will decide how your news feed is being organized, often without the knowledge or agency of a user or a proper understanding why they see what they see. Now, there is a part of platform's efforts to actually explain to a user precisely how the information is being organized in their news feeds, but at the same time, they don't really give a possibility to opt out or opt in uh, to online users or to simply organize their own news feeds in a way as they like, uh, you know, just the basic chronological order that could be prioritized by many users. So what I would like to see in the future is the return of uh, more control and more agency over information we receive and we impart. And also for smaller communities and smaller platforms to thrive on the market. Uh, because if there is a possibility of healthy competition and the smaller uh, platforms can actually thrive and provide the same services that only big giant platforms are doing right now, uh, you can also then enforce, let's say, the community standards, uh, which are more agreed upon with that, by that community that is the part of that platform. And then you can perhaps even reinforce a better safety and security of online users who are using those platforms. So that would be my wish for the future. And ultimately, and I will repeat it again, uh, transparency and stuff like interoperability, for instance, uh, is the way how to achieve that result. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, John, what do you got? What's on the yeah, wish list? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think Alishka knocked a bunch of things off my list, wish list. Uh, so it's good to see that we have some like-minded individuals who are thinking about these problems. I think, you know, my fir the first thing on my wish list would, that it would be that companies stop making users the first line of defense, right? For too long, 
social media companies in particular have relied on their users to be the shield, right? By which reports are given and they get intelligence about what's happening on their platform. And, and which this means is depressing that work. <laughs> it's, it's, de yeah, well, it's, it's, this is not, I'm not even talking about the content moderation industry. I'm literally mm -hmm. talking about, you know, you Alexis having to report when someone is harassing you on a platform, mm -hmm. like as an individual, I mean, this is, this mm -hmm. is the state of affairs at this point. Right. Uh, and and it, it extends into the yeah. content moderation world. So what that really means is better detection, a willingness to take a clear stand against hate. Um, I would love for users to have better tools and information overlays on the types of content that they're experiencing. And I think Alishka put it, it'd be nice to know what type of users you're interacting with. Right. So that, that would be, that would be the second thing. And then the last thing is I think companies really need to be pressed for more transparency about how they're moderating, what, how much content they're moderating, when they're moderating, and why they're moderating. Because at the end of the day, if you create more transparency, it not only gives society more confidence that they're actually robust capabilities in place, and they're actually taking a stand, but also as users, it incentivizes great behavior, right? If I report someone, and I know that, you know, Twitter has, has actually taken action against that person, that's great. That means that I am incentivized to continue to reporting users, to continue engaging with the system such that I can improve the ecosystems that I love being a part of. Yeah. And that's, and look, that is the product feedback loop that drives all of the content creation, right? It's feeling good because you post the photo that someone else hearts or retweets. Like we know these mechanisms exactly. work. <laughs> they just have not been applied to, to this and, uh, and they really should. Um, all right. Well, Derek, take us home. What's, what's on the list? What's top it, of the list for these platforms? Yeah, it, it, it's not a lot more I can add. I mean, they pretty much captured it. Transparency is absolutely <laughs> important. Mm. Build it, uh, mm -hmm community standard that's shared across companies because some of the uh, words and racial hate speech is not only within particular countries, it's within regions uh, of the country and building out a way to approach it. And then finally, actually putting yourself in the position of what would you want to see your children consume on these platforms? How would you want them to walk away from their experience? And if they are different, be it difference, be it male or female, or whatever the mm. subcategory of other, uh, would you want them to use your platform and walk away and feel proud and, and included? Or do you want them to walk away, feel as if they've been attacked and maligned? Uh, that's so important. Our only goal here is how do we protect people and how do we maintain a level of governance with stability and respect for your neighbor. Well, well put, Derek. And as a proud girl dad uh, of a three-year-old, <laughs> I can't help but feel like that, that is really the lens through which I make a lot of my decisions now, um, whether it was backing Centropy or even just in the, the businesses that I want to be a part of and uh, and support. Like it's, we, we have these are very important times to be having a, a huge impact and, and hopefully getting this trajectory in the right direction. Um, I want to thank um, all of you. Uh, seriously, uh, uh, I mean, Derek Johnson, President CEO of the NAACP, um, Alishka Perkova, you're a policy analyst uh, in Access Now, John Redgrave, Centropy CEO and co-founder. And, and I say on behalf of all of us, there's still so much work to be done, but we know we have to fight this fight um, there are far more of us out there who want the internet to live up to the, the best possible internet that it can be. And, and that's going to take work and that's going to take having the courage to, uh, to encourage folks to have the courage, uh, to lead and, and really better safeguard our online communities against digital hate. So, um, thank you RightsCon for having us here to talk about these issues. Thank you to all of you who have tuned in, taken time out of your days. Um, and thank you, of course, to my illustrious guests. Um, follow all of them on whatever social media platforms you like, and they will all do their very best to make sure that your experience is as uh, positive and hate-free as possible, that we work working hard towards that. 
Um, I we we definitely spent a lot of time talking about how and why we want social media to be better. I really do believe that, that is rooted in the fact that we care, that we know just how much potential it has and just how much good it can do. And so you've just heard 40 minutes of experts talking about why things need to be better and how problematic things are, but it's because we know what great potential there is and we want to see it fulfilled. And we know the only way that happens is if it really is a place where, where anyone can find their home. So thank you uh, again for, for taking the time. Thanks everybody. Thanks Alexis.